to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And we are really pleased to finally be releasing episode 109 for you. If you're new to the show, we're an Australian couple living in Germany and Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program that brings you knitting inspiration from around the world together with little snippets of travel, history and other stories to bring a little extra joy to your day and maybe put a smile on your face. I do have to mention that I am ill again in case you haven't picked that up already. So I apologize again for my voice, but I'm just <laughs> going to push through today. So our show today is focusing on Denmark again because we still have a lot to share with you from our recent trip to the island of Fernu back in September. The feature interview is with the Danish designer, teacher and author Vivian Hoeksbro. And Vivian has published many books on various knitting techniques, but she's probably best known for her work on domino knitting, which is also known as modular knitting. And more recently, Vivian has also published a book on traditional Danish nightshirts. And these were really beautiful sweaters worn by women in the 18th and 19th century, and they were knitted in very fine yarns. And these sweaters, for some reason, have previously been overlooked in historical Scandinavian hand knitting. But through Vivian's research and her efforts to reconstruct these historical garments and provide over 200 charts of traditional Danish motifs, we now as knitters all around the world get to learn about the night shirts and also just have another historical knitting style to enjoy, which I think is fantastic mm -hmm. because it just keeps adding to the world of knitting. So when I was researching Vivian and I soon found out that she had enough material to do at least two full feature interviews and luckily for us she agreed to do two interviews. So today's interview is going to cover Vivian's career in general and her extensive contribution to domino or modular knitting and in a follow-up interview we're going to learn all about the traditional Danish nightshirts. Now, I do realise I've just spoken about the nightshirts and sparked a lot of curiosity, which you and you won't see the nightshirts in today's interview. But I just want to assure you that you'll also really enjoy getting to see what Vivian's done with domino knitting because it's very colourful and very creative. And Vivian's just a charming, lovely lady with a very melodic, soft Danish accent. So I think you'll really enjoy the interview. Yep. Back in episode 108, we showed you a collage of our experiences on the island of Fernu. Today, we're going to take you on a tour of a sea captain's house, which dates back to the late 17th century. The house has been preserved as a museum, so it's in beautiful condition. We get a private tour, so it's a great chance to get a real insight into what life was like on the island around that time. I have to say, I haven't been doing much knitting myself, but Andrea has been pushing ahead with her paisley jacket and today she's going to give you a really close look at how she reinforces the steaks on that jacket using a sewing machine it's a really quick and easy technique and i think it's a really good thing to see so that's coming up she'll also be cutting the steaks which is always fun our daughter madeline has been here for about the last week and she's actually started a new kim hargraves project so she's going to be dropping in and saying hello and showing you that project too so that's also a lot of fun so just the quickest of updates before I get on and show you my project. A lot has been happening since we spoke to you. I think it was over two weeks ago. So in the last two weeks, oh, <laughs> full on things have been happening. Andrew's energy levels are very, very low at the moment. So he does almost nothing and yeah. <laughs> I do almost everything. So I spend a lot of my time looking after him yes. and driving him around to different appointments and things. Yeah. And then on top of that, uh, I happened to get that I came down with the norovirus, which uh, last week, which is a very violent gastro infection, uh, yeah. but ha happily very contagious, very, very contagious. Yeah. So I isolated myself in our bedroom and ensuite bathroom and didn't come out for three days. Luckily, it doesn't last very long, but I was really worried that if Andrew got it, he would lose even more weight and end up in hospital. So <laughs> that was a real worry. And then, of course, um, that part of the house doesn't even have any Wi-Fi, so I'm stuck in there for three days. I felt like I'd joined a convent for some kind of spiritual isolation retreat. 
shit. And so I'm stuck there. Andrew's out here trying to fend for himself, which he can't really do. So our daughter Madeline had to come up from Ulm. As soon as she could. As yeah. soon as she could to, to look after him. But you didn't catch the, the no. um, virus, the virus, which is no. wonderful. So it, is, it kind of paid off in the end. But that was a real drama on top of everything. Yeah. So things have been... It's fairly crazy. Pretty crazy behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but we are glad to be here and the aim of today's uh, podcast is to give you a happy, a happy time with knitting, yep. a happy, joyful time with knitting. So we'll move on and do that and we'll start with my project and I do have to say I have been working on this project. It's the Paisley Jacket by Sissel Hurjavik. I've been working on it for about three months now. Well, I've that's when I started it, but I have done very little knitting. But I have done enough progress to give you a decent update. So we'll start with this. So just to remind you, it's knitted in the it knitted in the round, bottom up. It's a project full of steaking because it's going to be a jacket. You've got steaking stitches down the front and there's steaks in the armholes and the neck. And I've already reinforced all of my steaks on the sewing machine and I've cut the armhole and the neck one's open already. Now, you might remember in the last episode, episode 108, that um, I was telling you that I was getting a different gauge on the checkered pattern, which is on the back, than the paisley pattern, which is on the front. And this is this is quite an unusual thing because it's knitted in the round, so I'm knitting both patterns on the same needle size. And even though that happened, I was getting a smaller gauge, a tighter gauge on the checkered pattern. And I was very worried that the back section was going to be too narrow, particularly the upper back between the shoulders, because that's where you really need to be able to do this kind of movement. And I did tell you back in that episode that I was thinking of ripping it back and redoing it and knitting the checkered pattern on a larger, larger size needle than the paisley pattern. Well, I did do that. I knitted it. I ripped it right back to the underarms and re-knit it. And back in episode 108, I can remember telling you a very convoluted way of how I was going to manage it. And I think it had involved four needles. And as soon as I published that episode, I realized that that was a load of rubbish. <laughs> it's very simple to do this, just using two needles. And some of you also said that in the comments. I think some sock knitters. Yeah. That. So yeah. in case you ever find yourself like me in a situation where you're knitting something in the round, it's got two different patterns on it and you need to use two different needle sizes. This is what you do. It's very simple. So I had all of my paisley stitches on a 3.5 millimeter cable needle, so just a long one, so it's got two ends on it. And then I had all of my checkered pattern stitches on a 3.75 millimeter needle. Again, just a long cable needle with two ends. And of course, the easy thing that you do is that when you're knitting around and say you come to the paisley section, you just get the other end of the cable needle and knit across. Bring it around and knit across. And then you get to the checkered section and you get the other end of the checkered needle, pattern needle, and knit across that. So it's sort of like you're just knitting flat. Very easy. <laughs> Not at all difficult. So I, I did knit back and I think it's successful. I have already, like quite a few weeks ago, blocked the bottom part of the garment. So you might pick up that it looks a little bit neater down here. But I think once I, I block everything, you really won't be able to tell that I've knitted the upper body in a larger needle size. At the moment, it's, it's more messy, so you can probably see it clearer. But in the end, I think I'll get away with it pretty easily. So I just want to show you again quickly what the original design looked like. So here's a picture of it. So you can see that it's a very tailored jacket. It's got waist shaping and it actually goes right down to the mid hips. But I'm making mine a cropped jacket with the bottom of the garment probably ending about three centimeters below my belly button. So this is a super easy modification to do. It's probably one of the easiest things. If you've never modified a, a garment, it's a good thing just to start modifying the length up and down. So what I'm doing is literally just knitting the top part of the garment. So my waist is going to be narrow like the jackets and then I'm going to increase 
up towards the widest bit across the bust here, about a few centimeters below the armholes. So what I do is I just look in the pattern for the stitch count at the narrowest part of the waist and I use that stitch count to cast on in and then I just knit my colorful band and then follow the pattern for the upper body waist shape or the upper body shaping gradually increasing outwards. So that's a really easy thing to do. If you wanted to make it into a cropped jacket but just make it like a boxy cropped straight up and down and straight like that, you look in the pattern for the stitch count across the bust. So that'll be the widest part and use that stitch count to cast on and then you do your colorful band and then just knit straight up. So it's really, really easy. So if you wanna play around with a jacket and just get confidence in, in modifying something, that's a good place to start. So like I said, I've already reinforced all of my sticking stitches and I've cut the armhole and the neck uh, steaks open. And I'm gonna show you how I did that in a lot more detail in just a minute. But first of all, I wanna say, my mind has been so chaotic lately that I just haven't done things the way I normally do. I kind of just picked up the, I hardly follow the pattern. I just pick up my knitting, I sort of cast on random amounts of sticking stitches and just knit through them. Actually, I, I've showed you this jacket before. This is another Sissel Hoevik jacket and I'm basing this jacket on this one. So whenever I knit, I kind of just have this hanging around on my knee and the pattern. And I actually look at this garment even more than the pattern and just kind of copy it. It's sort of the most, the, it's the, it's your reference. It's my reference and it's easier actually for me to copy that than to look in the pattern and and modify things. So, uh, yeah, so I want to show you how I what I normally do when my mind is focused with sticking stitches because I organize them in a way and there's two things I want to share with you which I think are really helpful. The first thing I do, if you're doing a jacket and you've got sticking stitches going down the center, I don't cast on the amount of sticking stitches that the pattern tells me. What I do is look in the pattern and work out exactly how wide the final button band is going to be in centimeters. And then I cast on the exact amount of, of sticking stitches that'll give me that exact width. And what that does is that it means that every time you try the garment on, you're going to get a perf it's going to be as if you've already done your button bands so you don't have to second guess will I be have to add on more or take away more and you can really see is it a perfect fit or not so that's just a handy tip to do don't follow the pattern maybe the pattern's already done that but don't assume it has and go and check the size of the button bands and then cast on using your gauge as many st sticking stitches as you need to get that width the other thing I do is I organize or I pattern my sticking stitches in a clear pattern and that helps me. So here's a picture of what I normally do. I keep both outside edge stitches the same color so that later on when I've cut it open and I'm picking up stitches either to knit on the button bands or knit the sleeves downwards or, or do a neck edging, I can clearly see where the garment finishes and where the steaks start. And then with the other, the, the middle steaking stitches, I usually do a checkerboard pattern. And often I, I probably cast on about eight or 10 stitches. So what I did was just a lot more chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to be really careful when I was actually sewing on the sewing machine to make sure that I was sewing exactly down a column of steak stitches and not the outside fabric. But I did make it work. But if you do that patterning, it makes life a lot easier later on. Okay, so there's one other thing I want to tell you, one other adjustment that I had to make. So getting back to using two needle sizes on the upper body. So I used the 3.75 millimeter on the pattern at the back and that gave me exactly what I wanted. It gave me a wider gauge, which gave me the width that I needed across the upper back. But it also gave me a little longer gauge too, so that the back, what happened was, although you're knitting in the round and there's exactly the equal amount of rows on the front and the back, the back, ended up being just slightly longer than the front. So to adjust for that, what I did was I 
separated the front and back shoulders just a little bit earlier than what I normally would do. So I cast off my, there's my stick, the underarm stick, just a little bit earlier. And then I knitted these top shoulders, the top front and back shoulders separately, just knitting and purling back. That's pretty easy to do because it's not much. And I added on three extra rows on the paisley pattern on the front. And that way both pieces of material were exactly even. So small amounts like that you can really fudge and get away with no problem at all without distorting the fabric in any other way. Yeah, I think you were quite lucky with that because you started doing that from the start of the yeah. sleeve. So up to here, everything's even. The row gauge is even, but here you've got different row gauges. Yeah. And But that's okay because they're separate, they can move. Yeah. Otherwise you would have sort of had a tension on that line and it would have kind of So the only thing it's way. done is lowered my neck just yeah. a tiny okay. bit. Yeah. Okay, but that doesn't matter. So it's only a small amount. You can fudge it and get away with it. In fact, it's quite fun to fudge things and get away with them. <laughs> so Getting I, away with it's great. Yeah, that's the fun Always bit. good. <laughs> okay, so I think that's successful and that's all done, which is really cool. Okay, so then there's the two sleeves. So here's, which I've done both of them up to the armholes. There they are there. And this one, I'm doing the cap and I'm just knitting the cap in in the flat so knitting and purling back that's a really easy thing to do because this pattern is probably the easiest pattern to to purl knitting because you, you there's no floats that you have to weave in and you a float is only ever going to be three stitches wide so there we go there but otherwise on something like that like on a sleeve cap you could actually do another stick yeah, up here couldn't you? quite often and i have Mm. I did on this. Okay. Yeah. Probably. On. No, because that's the no. drop shoulder. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> of course, it's just round. Yeah. Okay, so the next thing after that, I might uh, sew the sleeves on, but after that, I'm going to put a little collar on. I'm, uh, so I'm just pretty well mindlessly copying what I did with this jacket here. So I'm going to put a nice little neat collar on this one too. I haven't yet decided whether I'll do the collar in the paisley pattern or the checkered pattern. Probably logically and balance wise the checkered pattern will look best because then you've got arms and back in checkered and just paisley down the front and a little co collar in checkered. But what I will do is do the, the collar in garter stitch which is going to distort the pattern anyway and that's really cool because it makes it look like that the pattern on that the material on the collar is made from a different kind of material you can see it here it just looks cool it's it's the same pattern yeah. but it's distorted so it, it makes it look like it's a little bit thicker yep. collar yep. so I'm excited to do that so after the collar comes the embroidery and the sequins and they go down these two panels here and also on the cuff, around the cuff. And this little bit of, of floppy pink that you see at the bottom of the sleeves and the hem, that's the facing. So I will first of all do the embroidery here around the cuff and then what's really cool is so that you don't see the inside, uh, the wrong side of the embroidery, you can turn this up and sew it down at the end. So they are the next steps. So coming up now, you'll see in a lot more detail how I've reinforced and cut my steaks. So here's the Paisley Kofta by Cicel Hoevik. The body is knitted bottom up in the round. There's sticking stitches down the front middle that'll be cut open later to make it into a jacket. And the armholes are set in sleeves. So when you get up to the armholes, you first have to cast off the initial amount of stitches that the pattern says to on both sides. I think in my case it was around 11 stitches. And this results in then having two gaps in this tubular fabric. So in the very following row, you need to cast on some extra steaking stitches to close up those gaps. And that allows you to continue knitting up in the round. And all of the armhole shaping decreases are done on either side of these steaking stitches. You can see them here. So that's all of my decreases here. So when I got up to the front neck, 
I cast off the middle stitches and again on the following row cast on more sticking stitches over the top. So this allows me to continue knitting up in the round. And you can also see here that the neck decreases happen on either side of these sticking stitches. So when I lie it flat like this, that little motive there is sort of turning inwards like that and that's because of all of the decreases that are happening here on either side of the steak stitches. Then when you get up to the back neck shaping, after you've cast off the middle back neck stitches, you could insert another little steak so that you can continue to knit in the round all the way up to the top of the shoulders, but I didn't do that. I cast off my center back stitches and also my armhole sticking stitches at the same time. So that separated the front and the back completely. And I worked just the last few rows on the back shoulders and the front shoulders separately. So just knitting and purling back and forth. So I did this mainly because I needed to do three extra rows on the, my front than I did on my back. And that's because I used two different needle sizes to knit this body. I used a larger needle to knit this back pattern than I did on the front pattern. And I had to do that to make sure that the stitch gauge on both patterns would end up the same. I achieved that, but a side effect is that the row gauge on the back was just slightly longer than the row gauge on the front. And to make both lengths even, I knitted three extra rows on the front. And separating the front and the back just for those last few rows allowed me to do that. So when you are messing around changing patterns and gauges, sometimes you do need to fudge a bit. And that's okay, you can easily do that as you go along. But you do need to make sure that you're measuring your work regularly and that you're just prepared to rip open small sections and rethink it. In the original pattern, Cecil shapes the shoulders so they're slanting a little bit and she does that by casting off in steps and normally I really do like to do that because it, it's nice to have shaped shoulders. But these shoulders are really pretty narrow so I'm going to keep it easy and I'm just going to do a three needle bind off without any shaping. But before I close up my shoulder seams, I do like to sew and cut all of the steaks, so the front neck steak and the armhole steaks, because once you've joined up the, sh the shoulder seams, it's so much harder to maneuver the sewing machine inside the knitting. So I'm gonna show you how I do that now. So first of all, I'm going to use a long straight stitch that'll go right down the middle of this column of edge stitches. So there, where you see those dark stitches, and again on the other side, down that, that column there. So I finished those long straight stitches on both sides. This side looks a bit botchy because I accidentally sewed in my yarn thread so then I had to unpick bits of it and redo it so that's why it looks messy but that doesn't matter at all. So now I'm going to use a zigzag stitch set to medium length and as wide as possible and I'll sew this zigzag stitch slightly further away from the neck edge, that's the neck edge there so that it catches the outside legs of two different columns of stitches. So I'm going to work with this column of dark stitches and this column of light stitches and the zigzag stitch will catch the outside leg of that stitch together with the outside leg of the light stitch. So it'll just run down there and that way the knitting is never going to come apart. I'm stretching the fabric slightly widthwise while I'm sewing and that keeps the fabric from stretching lengthwise too much because the sewing machine foot will tend to drag the material lengthways anyway. So now that that's done I'll cut up the middle of the steak and then I'll trim it down further to only about two or three stitches wide and then later on it's going to be sewn back. The armhole and neck steaks have been reinforced and cut. It's all open now and it's, I can try it on and see if it fits me. And I can also do the three needle bind off on the shoulders.
Coming up now is our little tour of the sea captain's house, 17th century. But before we do that, I did want to tell you a couple of things about the houses on Fernu. There are two sort of main factors that influence the houses on the, on the island. And the first of these is really the very harsh environment coming from the North Sea. The other is the wealth that accumulated on the island during the maritime era, which mm. went from the middle of the 18th century to around the end of the 19th century. And there are some really fascinating and uh, interesting architectural aspects to the houses on the island. Yeah. They tend to be aligned from west to east. And uh, in the past, the western end of the house was always the stables. And this was to take the brunt of the winds from the North Sea. So the animals were there just made the rest of the house slightly warmer. You, um, something that you see is that the framing of the houses often uses leftover timber from the shipmaking operations that were taking place on the island at the time. And this is a really good way to date the houses so you can see how old they are. This shot here shows a few of the typical features of a traditional Fernu house. And I think many of these houses were built in the late 19th and early 20th century. They're built of red bricks and the mortar between the bricks is painted white and above the windows and the doorway you can see the stripes of white, green and black and these are known as eyebrows and the colours white, green and black symbolise life, hope and death. The men of the island were seafarers and were often away for years at a time so there would have been long periods of their family hoping for their safe return. But accidents, as we all know at sea, were very, very common and Fernu was also known as the Island of Widows. It looks like there were window sills underneath the windows, but these are actually just painted on in a simple 3D effect. And Andrew looked into this but hasn't been able to find out why this was done. We think it's just a simple stylistic touch. Occasionally you'll also see little round openings in the wall of a house. There's a little metal fitting on the inside that allows you to control exactly how much air flows through. I guess this is a good thing to have when the winds are really strong and cold because also the fuel for heating was very precious. So opening a window probably just wasn't an option for much of the year. And then above the main door, you can see a second door leading into the attic where the hay was stored for feeding livestock over the winter. And in these other houses, you'll see that the attic doors were normally much smaller and sometimes they've even been replaced by windows. These dogs are a little tradition that we loved. Two dogs are placed in the window near the entrance to the house. When the sailor of the house is at home, the dogs face inwards, but when he's out at sea, they face outwards awaiting the master's return. I think that's pretty much what Jack does, although I'm not sure that he's always sitting up so nice and straight when we're out of the house. <laughs> no, but he's always waiting for your return. Yeah. Andrew's his favourite. <laughs> and then finally, one more thing. You can see the thatched roof, which is still very common, and the thatched roofs would just look very neat and beautiful, particularly when they were allowed to grow back a little bit like this one here. Yeah, that was really fun the way that came back to life. There. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love these little architectural details and I also find the houses overall are just so beautiful. We walked around and it was one of the highlights of our visit to Fenu for me. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed learning a bit about the houses and I also hope you enjoy this little tour of the Sea Captain's Cottage. This is a typical skipper home on Fenø from the end of 1800 in the period where, where uh, the Fenø fleet was the second largest in Denmark. Only Copenhagen was bigger. Most of the men on the island were at sea for several years, so uh, the home 
and the island was run by women. Uh, the women had to take care of the housekeeping, the kids, the farming, the economy, and uh, some of the public matters on the island. Only they couldn't vote and they were not able to be uh, elected. On Fenø there was 55% uh, that were women because it was a very dangerous job to, to be a seaman, so many men didn't return. And uh, the contact between the man and the wife was letters. And when the husband returned, he was some sort of a stranger. The kids didn't know this foreign man who came and uh, slept together with the mother and, and uh, would decide anything uh, in the house. So he didn't stay at home for a long time. He felt that he was of no use, so he had to go on sea again and earn some more money. One out of four women here on Fanny were widow, and some were never married because there were not men enough. So uh, some of the women lived together and to, by two or three they had a house and they had a little farming. Maybe uh, one of them did some handcraft. Uh, maybe they had a loom so that they could work for other people in, uh, on the island or they could cook when there were parties. In that way they had their outcome. The clothes they made themselves, of course, but the seamen brought the beautiful silk and the cotton fabric home from uh, faraway countries. The, the women sewed, made the dresses, the shirts in hand. If she was lucky to have a sewing machine, she, of course, used that. The wool for the socks and the sweaters they had just outside the door with the sheep going out in the field. And uh, normally it uh, was the women who prepared the wool and uh, sp were spinning the yarn. But very often the men were knitting, especially socks. They were good at knitting socks. This beautiful furniture has many functions. It is a writing desk where the uh, wife sat and wrote her letters for her husband and it is uh, the store for napkins, sheets and underwear and uh, there are drawers for the jewelry buttons and uh, uh, belts and in fact inside there is a secret room and nobody knows what is in it. Here in the bedroom, the beds are very short and it wasn't because they were that short. They were shorter than we are now, but they didn't lay flat down on their back when they were sleeping. They were almost sitting. Only dead people were laying flat. Their health was very bad. They had bad lungs, so sitting up uh, in the bed, it was easier to cough. And I think they have been coughing the whole night. And uh, when they went to bed and they had shut the doors, it might have been rather nice and warm and uh, too intimate. The most important job for the housewife is, of course, providing food and cooking. Every family had a garden, hens, sheep, and now and then a cow, and they always used their own things. Uh, the stove was the most important place in the uh, house. It heated the whole house. And here in the copper was always hot water for everyday use and for special days when they were slaughtering. And most of the meat uh, they made into sausages and every woman had her own kit for making sausages. It's made out of 
cow horns and it has uh, different sizes so that you can make big sausages or small sausages. You just have to put the casing on here. Welcome back. I am plodding along on the Bowie top for Andrea, um, taking a little longer than, <laughs> than I had hoped. It sounds extraordinary, but I really am very often too tired, don't have the energy to do anything, um, any knitting, but occasionally I do get a couple of rows of stocking stitch done. It's a real shame that I just haven't got the concentration to do any of the lace on this sleeve. There is the beautiful lace border coming up, um, it, it's quite a lot of knitting and I really don't have the concentration to do that, but hopefully that will pick up at some time in the near future. <laughs> the near future well, will be fantastic. We'll see. Yeah. I do want to say again a big thank you to everyone who's provided support in so many different ways over the last, I don't know, four to six weeks, I guess, um, whether it's messages of encouragement, comments, uh, suggestions and advice, or of course, financial support. We really know we're not able to respond to so many different messages that we get, and we're really sorry about that, but we just can't do that. Um, please do know that we are extremely grateful yeah. for all of the support and encouragement and uh, the generosity that's been shown to us over the last weeks. It's, it's really touching. And just very quickly, if you are enjoying the program, then please do become a patron. You can do that by going to patreon.com slash fruity knitting, select your level of support and it's really easy. And if you would like to make a one-off donation towards our medical expenses, then go to paypal.me slash fruity knitting and you can do that there. Again, it's really easy and thank you again to, to everyone for, for the support that has been shown. Yes, thank you very much. Now, Madeline, our daughter, is going to join us and give us a quick little, or give you a quick little update on what she's doing. She's started a new project. So you can probably go off and have a snooze. I will do that. It's great. <laughs> That's all Andrew wants to do these days. Go and have a snooze, don't you? Yep, yep. Okay. So Madeline's come to join us and give us Hello. a bit of an update on what she's been knitting on. Yep. So for the past year or a bit longer even, I've been working on The Bressa by Marie Wallen. This is how far I've gotten. I have also knitted the sleeves up, yeah. up to the point where you're supposed to start with the ferrule. Yeah. Um, I've, I really, really enjoy knitting ferrule. Um, but even though I do enjoy it so much, I've only ever worked on the project for like very short times, short periods, and then had long breaks in yeah. between. And I'd hoped that I could at least finish this jumper this like this year still um, but with what's going on at the moment we decided that it's better for me to do an easy knit that doesn't require mum's help so much because you know you guys are busy I'm busy studying and yeah. helping as well so we okay wanted something mindless. so I got out all of my Kim Hargraves patterns because they're just really good simple stylish knits that are very easy yeah yeah, yeah. and um, basically one of my uh, requirements was that the knit would be very fast that I can still wear it this season so yeah we looked through mum's Kim Hargraves books and we came across this design called inviting and I really liked it so here's a picture it comes from her book covet capsule collection number seven 
And you can knit the pattern as a, length, a knee length dress or a jumper that goes halfway down to your hips. And it's knitted in Rowan's brushed fleece, which is a bulky yarn made from a blend of wool and alpaca. It's a really simple design with stocking stitch most of the places and then a two by two rib on the neck, the cuffs and the hem. Yeah. Okay, but you're not gonna do a dress or a, a long version, are you? No, I'm making a cropped version. And the yarn, so the, the brushed fleece yarn, it comes in lots of beautiful different colors. I but chose cream. I know, it's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> Mum's disappointed and I understand why because we both really like colorful yarns. Yeah. Um, as you can see on all of Mum's projects. But uh, the thing is that I have so many colourful jumpers that I thought a neutral coloured jumper would be best because I also have a lot of colourful skirts and dresses and it's just easier to find something to match up with them. That's true. Yeah. That's very true. So it's either going to be cream or black. Mm -hmm. And I think cream is kind of fresher it's and elegant. lighter. Yeah. Okay. And you're also doing a cropped version. So. Yeah. So I basically knew that I wanted a fitted jumper. Um, and one that's cropped so it goes down to my waist and that way I'll be able to wear it with my wide skirts I have a lot of wide skirts old-fashioned skirts and Yeah, I also knew that I wanted a turtleneck because that way I can wear all my skivvies underneath and Inviting was perfect for that. Yeah, so it had everything she needed except for it was too long. Yeah, so mum just said we can um, Change the pattern a little bit to make it shorter and that's what we're doing. Yeah Madeline had the idea that I should just design her a, a jumper, but it's actually much easier if you're time pressed just to find something that's almost right, that you like most of it, and then that's so much easier, and then just sort of make the modifications and start from scratch. Mm. So that's what we've done. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Well, the way the um, jumper is knitted, you knit it from the bottom up and in pieces, and then you just sew them together. And, and you've then, done that a lot, so yeah. that's no problem for you. Yeah, I've, I've done those in the past, that shouldn't be a problem. And um, then what's nice about this design is that it has shape wa waist shaping. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we're doing is we're taking the stitch count from the narrowest part of the waist and we're using that as the stitch count on where the stocking stitch um, section starts. Yeah. And on the original pattern, you can see it has a two by two rib underneath and the original pattern the two by two rib sits on your lower part of your hips um, and that's why it has about a difference of 10 stitches between the rib section and the stocking stitch section but because mine's sitting higher up we're only making it a difference of eight stitches yeah so yeah. it's a little bit tighter and the ribbing's always done on a smaller needle anyway but it just means that it, it looks nicer it's tighter and but it's still got stretch mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. and then you're just simply, so now that, that's all we had to change is just find out what stitch count to start off with and then for the upper body shaping, just like I've told you on my um, paisley jacket, you're just now going to follow the pattern exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty easy. So you don't need me at all. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. And this brushed, brushed fleece, you did the darkness coat mm -hmm. and it is so light and so warm. It's yep. such a beautiful, beautiful yarn. So yep. this is going to be really gorgeous. Yes. And you also wanted a polo neck, I think, because you wanted to wear skivvies, didn't you? Yeah, I've mentioned that before. Oh, have you? Okay. Yep. Cool. Okay, so let's call Dad back in and we'll say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> So we're all back on the couch again because we're going to say a final goodbye because coming up now is our really great interview with Vivian Herxbro, which I know you're going to really enjoy. It's a total feast of colour for your eyes. And Vivian is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount on all of her patterns in her online Ravelry store. So enjoy looking through them and thank you very much to Vivian. So thanks for being with us again today. We really love having your company and we will see you again as soon as we can. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye.
welcome to Fruity Knitting. I am very excited to be here in Denmark with one of Denmark's great knitting personalities, Vivian Herxbro. Vivian mm -hmm. is a well-known knitwear designer and teacher, both in Scandinavia and North America. And over the 30 or so years that she's been working in the industry, Vivian has also published several books on different knitting techniques. And one technique that she particularly loves and has explored extensively is domino knitting, which is also known as modular knitting. And that's going to be the main focus of our interview today. So Vivian, it's great to be in your studio on the island of Falster. So thank you so much for inviting us. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and I have to say that we can see out the window in front of us here. You can't see it. It's a shame, but it's a beautiful view of sailing boats. And, and there's a lot of sea everywhere around here because mm -hmm. it is the island of it's, it's the country of islands. Yeah, it is. So can you just uh, start with filling out my introduction a little bit more yeah. and giving us a brief overview of your career? Yeah, as you said, I've been a designer now for 35 years. And um, I have been through ups and downs of knitting and yarn sale. And um, I've worked for different yarn companies. And one of the, especially one of the yarn companies wanted me to design 70 designs a year. It was quite a lot. Yeah. So uh, after a while, I thought, well, let me just take a break. And I was invited actually to Mexico, Yucatan where I stayed in my hammock for a month and worked with embroidery. And the colors there were, were so spectacular and sort of, I thought, wow, well, maybe I could use so many colors. And so when I came home, I, um, I wrote the Domino Knitting book. And um, yes, it here. and it yeah. was published by a Norwegian publisher because at that time, no Danes would publish it, a knitting book. And then um, I got it published in the US as well. It's a tiny little edition though, but it meant a lot to me because Interweave asked me to go on a three week promotion tour. And it ended up by being a seven week promotion tour because the phone rang off the hook. And uh, so I traveled all the way from north to south of the US and um, I learned a terribly, I learned a lot of the language and I learned a lot by teaching all the wonderful knitters in the US. And I still have many, many friends over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while you were over there, you also developed your own yarn yes. lanes. So I, show us a few of these. One of the, one of the, after the first uh, seven week tour, I was invited to Harrisville and, uh, it was a beautiful little village and wonderful people. And it was in April and I, I actually snowed in, in April. And uh, we've, I had time to knit with their yarn and talk to them. And we sort of, you know, uh, they, their yarn just uh, was the right yarn for me, ex except it was a little too heavy. So when I turned home, they wanted me to, they wanted to, to spin the right yarn, mm -hmm. the right weight. And uh, they invited me to come over and do a, a new um, color, color range. range. Yeah. And uh, that was a wonderful and wonderful uh, experience. 64 colors. With 64 colors that could work together, I could do almost anything. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Okay, so now before we really get into the technical side of domino knitting, can you share the story of how you were first introduced to it? Yes. <laughs> um, when I had to do all the designs, I also had to get inspiration. Yeah. And in order to get inspiration, I went to several craft shows, one of them in Germany. And in, in that craft show, there was a man, a man who was showing something really, really strange to me. And then I talked to him and he said, well, it's, uh, how, this is how I do it. And I decided to, I got his book and uh, I decided to, we deci I decided to invite some Danes and uh, wanted them to go to Berlin where we, where we visited him and he showed us his technique and we learned it. I cast it on the knit cast on 29 stitches and then I fainted. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. I fainted and I'm probably the only woman who has slept in his bed. <laughs> hmm. 
<laughs> That's a funny story. Okay, so what kinds of things was he doing at that time with the technique? Because I think this is similar to... Yeah. Um, I'm always very... Um, what do you say? I'm planning my colors very neat and proper. But he he just... He took a lot of colors and put them in a plastic bag, mm -hmm. and then he would pick one. Oh, what a nice color. I didn't do that. <laughs> That's not my kind of thing. But um, And he, did, he knitted different figures, like squares and like this. Um, I don't know what, clams. They look like clams. Yeah, All shells, sorts of yeah. figures. And uh, this, when I came home, I did this one. It's actually... Upside down. Oh, I'm doing it upside down. Okay. <laughs> and uh, my friend, a friend of mine, made it for me. And there are 48 uh, colors from Rowan. Yeah. And uh, I decided it should be would be colors like the heather, and they they had to be like in little areas, area of yellow, area of purple, and so on and so forth, and uh, dark in the on the bottom and lightened up at the and it. It is absolutely a perfect sweater for my taste. Yeah, so Hurst Schultz, he was mainly using the technique to do uh, garments, was he? Or garments. accessories for the house? Yeah, garments. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. But, so Great. I learned a lot from him and I visited him several times. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the actual technical part of, of domino knitting in a lot more detail now. Yeah. Can you... Uh, perhaps give us some practical tips, show some examples, yeah. and also talk about the advantages of the technique. Yeah. Um, Horst Schulz always wanted me to do different shapes, but I sort of have enough for a whole lifetime with just domino squares. So I started, when I teach domino, I use, for, for example, this uh, little sample swatch, and uh, they need to to first knit cast on. Do you want to see? Yes. How yeah. you knit cast on? Uh, I didn't know about knit cast on before I met Horst Schultz. And here we go. You knit one stitch and then you pull the thread and get into it, twist it. Mm -hmm. And you knit one more and go into it, twist it. And this kind of cast on will easily be to loose so make sure you tighten it every for every stitch you cast on it's a very nice cast so why on. is it a particularly important one? it is because you you cast on with you don't need to figure out how long it, the tail you need and you cast on from you can cast on from anywhere uh, and that's what you need for domino knitting. Okay, yeah. okay, that's good to know. While we're talking about yarn and needles, mm -hmm. you've got short yeah. needles yeah. here. Why is that? And yeah, it's very important because when you knit one square, you have maybe have a huge blanket here, and then you knit one square, and then you turn, and you turn, and it's very easy. You don't need to turn the whole blanket. You can only turn this. If the needles are longer, it's a lot of movement. Yeah. So. It's very, very um, Useful, relaxed. Yeah. Okay. So back to your demonstration square. Yeah. How does that happen? So when you have uh, knit casted on, like let's say 29 stitches, you, can, you are going to knit. And you always uh, decrease two stitches at the center and then make sure you, you make a nice, um, a nice end stitch. And except, especially if you knit um, stripes, two rows of each color, it's very important to get to get it nice and not too tight. And I always put one thread, one color on top of each other instead of hiding it away. And that gives you this sort of three-legged stitch, and it's very nice. And, and, and from very here, yeah. yeah, from here, I want to knit this little triangle, like it's like a half of it. Mm -hmm. And instead of uh, decreasing two, I decrease only one stitch at the end of every right side row. And of course, it's all in garter stitch. I love garter stitch. And then when you want to, to work like a whole sweater, you always go like this from one, from the left to the right in panels. 
And you can do this. You've done all of this in garter stitch, but yeah. actually you can do it in stocking stitch. In stripes. Or stocking stitch. stitch will make it a little more, uh, not as uh, square shaped. Of course. But, yeah. but it still looks really beautiful. Okay. Yeah. But, but you can make all different um, design issues, like shape, like lace or a little dot. Can yeah. I show you yes. one of my old designs? This is one of the first designs from, from a kit collection. And here, it's if you look at it from this side, mm -hmm. you see there's a stripe in the square, and it makes these little wings. And this is only squares, and then I did, I figured out to make these little dots at the bottom. Little pom-pom balls. Yeah, we, we see it's so worn out. Yeah. <laughs> it's 20 years old. <laughs> so the garter stitch will always give you because the rows are two rows to one stitch. It's a square. And it's a, it's yeah. a good it's square. It's a perfect design element. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I love and it. what about this one here? And this is, um, so this is interesting because it's not squares. So I'd start by knitting this, uh, this here panel, and then I'll knit along and one row back. Then I cast on with the knit cast on. The knit cast on gives me so many possibilities because you can knit cast on from anywhere. And then I knit the, um, the cable. And every time I go here, I knit two together, purl two together, go back, purl two together, and add it to it. And so it gives me the possibility of, of using lots and lots of colors in a cable sweater without having all these balls of yarn in the yeah. back. Yeah. So this has been quite popular. So do you have, if you're going to introduce different stitches like this here, mm -hmm. you have to make sure that your calculations are absolutely right. So yes. it doesn't get distorted. And you know, garter stitch and, uh, and, and, uh, and cable yeah. works really good together. Okay. That mm -hmm. cable. Yeah. yeah. It has, well, cable, if you, cable always need more stitches. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. And, and this one is called the Navajo. And I got the idea when I visited uh, the Native Indian um, art. Well, it was one floor in an art museum and it was only Native Indian art. And there were the Navajo weavings and there were feather works and it was so beautiful. So when I came home, I did this. Uh, and again, it's in panels. and looking like a beginning of a square and panels knitted onto the next. They are all joined together. And this is supposed to be the bird. Okay. So you see the feathers okay. in it and it's kind of a bird. <laughs> I like it a lot. Yeah. It's so lovely. That's from Denver. And to design with different shapes, I, I cause I use the computer a lot. Um, I'm a computer person <laughs> and I'm married to one. <laughs> so, and I always draw my little uh, figures and I try to put them together so that I can see them for real and not only flat. And I, I actually, <laughs> I want knitters to do the same because it's much easier to yeah. figure out what happens. Okay, so mm -hmm. that is how you're I'm designing. gauging and designing the shape yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. And are there any special tricks for joining or knitting off in different directions? Is there anything else, any other practical tips like that that you have to be careful yeah. of? There's a there's something I used to I used to be asked why do you end with a purl stitch, and uh, of course I could have ended with a, a knit stitch, but the purl stitch. Is easy because when I add, when I join one panel to the other, mm -hmm. I'd always join them with a purl stitch, two purls together, purl two together. Because if you look at the ribbing, the the purl stitch will always sort of hide away, that's and that's true. the same thing happens when you knit two together. They hide away. They recede, don't they? Yeah. yeah that's so that's good. very okay. nice. Now the concept of domino knitting has been around for a while. So are you able to say where else it's been used or and with what variations? Um, yeah, we actually, Interweave and I tried to figure out if we were actually, if, if we were allowed to use the technique. They figured out that um, 
there was a lady called Virginia Bellamy Woods okay. who actually in 1952 wrote a book called Number Knitting. I didn't like the name because I don't want to think about 135 squares. I just want to knit and enjoy the process. But in this uh, searching, um, I got a letter and I saw it was from Meg Swanson, like, wow, God is writing to me. Yeah. <laughs> And she told me that there was uh, two shawls in one of the traditional shawl books from fa the Faroese Islands. And I looked at it up and said, wow! And they were with, with a lace pattern in it. And then later on, when I went to the Faroese Islands, uh, there was uh, this, lady, this lady who had collected the shawls for the book. She said, well, they were not really traditional, but this lady who, who made these shawls, she was so clever, so they wanted them in the book. So they weren't old, really, okay. but still the same technique, the so same it, way. Exactly. So it's a concept that people in different isolated communities have discovered for themselves and used it in their own way. Horst yeah. has invented it. Bellamy Woods has invented it, yeah. and the lady in Fairies has yeah. invented it. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Okay, now like I, I just stole it. <laughs> <laughs> stole it and developed it. And made it my own. Yeah. yeah. So, like I said in the introduction, you've written several books on different knitting aspects, on aspects yeah. of different yeah. knitting, but you do keep coming back over the years to domino knitting yeah. and keep exploring it further. So, it would be really fun to see the developments that you've made like on a time scale, mm -hmm. you know, with the technique. So yeah. should we do that now? Yeah. I don't have a progressive line. I just design as I get inspired. Like I bought this, I have an example. I bought this little geisha silk purse in Japan. And I thought, wow, it's domino squares. And then I thought, well, I could do a domino a similar little thing. So I knitted domino squares on the bottom and worked the way up and it's shaped. So this is uh, this is my little yarn baskets when I fly. It's got a lovely bottom on it. Mm -hmm. And this is felted, so then it's you felted. started to get into yeah. felting. Yeah. And okay. I, I like to use uh, li linen fabric. <laughs> I like to choose colourful fabric. Now, just very quickly, the, there's two things that are really important with domino knitting. You have yeah. to do a good cast on, which is what you call the knit cast yes. on. And then you also have to be able to knit into and pick up stitches. Yeah. Do you have a tip for that? Well, I, I always uh, pick up a knit through, uh, through both loops because that will make it stronger. Yeah. And especially when I felt it, it needed to be strong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you've got some Japanese books here yeah. as well. Was yeah. that next or? Mm, there were Sometime. two. Sometime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. This was the second Japanese. And um, I, I started, uh, figured that, well, I could use, make holes in them. And so if you are lazy domino knitting, this will be the right thing for you to do. Because first I made the bottom, no holes in that, of course. And then um, you can't see it, but here's a square, sort of a square. So what I do is I knit, like, let's say, like six uh, garter ridges, and then I cast, I bind off, and then you have a hole. So, and another one, and another one, and that makes the holes here. Okay. And I had to felt it quite a lot, because I wanted it to be strong. And that's, so that's a little tote bag, knitting tote bag. And we've got a variation yeah. as a wall hanging. And that's from the American book, Knit to be Square. Okay, Knit to be Square, that's a great name. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't know what it meant, but it was American. Now this is 3D knitting. Yeah, so you can also, uh, I tried to make it more fun to knit and I thought, well, I might be able to knit a flower. So what I did is I knitted one little square. You can see a domino square here. Mm -hmm. And I folded it. And I picked up and knit here through both loops and uh, knitted another square. And there are a total of six squares and then a little embroidery in the middle. 
or buttons or whatever you like. So you've got a square and then you fold it in half and then along the ridge, the center ridge, you pick up stitches yeah. and do another square, yeah. fold it in half, yeah. pick up stitches along the center ridge. Exactly. That's lovely. That's and cool. this uh, ended up by being a nice little, um, a little purse. And I did this because when I, I had a heart problem and I decided that I wouldn't travel that much and teach so much. And I told Interweave Press that I wouldn't travel that much. And then they said, well, then you've got to do a DVD so you can teach on the DVD. And I did that. And one of the things from the DVD is this is almost worn out, but I use it a lot. And it is, again, domino squares on the bottom. And then these little, because when you knit one square and then you pick up and knit on the top of it, and in another square, you'll get these little double, double squares. And they and stick course, out beautifully. <laughs> and little then, pockets. In order to get a, a strong uh, little tote bag, I needed double knitting at, at the sides of the band. So it has actually hold for many, many years, and I've, I've, I've used it a lot. That's great. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Okay. It's, you can do a lot of fun with yeah. domino knitting. Yeah. 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 And what about what you're wearing? Is that um, an older uh, creation? This is or? a new one, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll be back to, um, we'll be back to it because this is um, the beginning of my 13th book. Okay. Well, we are <laughs> going to talk about that. We'll but be before back. we do talk about that book, mm -hmm. and I think that book is coming out next year, yeah. we do need to quickly mention your book on shadow knitting, which yeah. was published in 2013. Mm -hmm. So for the viewers who haven't heard of shadow knitting, can you give us an explanation of what okay. the technique is? Of course. And then show us some examples and say the different kinds yeah, of I'll things that you this, can do with the technique. This one. Yeah. Well... Shadow knitting is uh, a very easy way of patterning and using colors together. Uh, you basically only knit and purl. So when you are on the right side of your work, you'll, you'll always only knit. And when you are on the wrong side, you will knit and purl alternately. So if you finished your right side row, I would put markers in uh, according to the pattern. And then when I'm on the wrong side, I knit to the first marker, purl to the next, knit to the next, purl to the next. So it's kind of easy. And I always, uh, there are always only two colors at the time. And I, I change color every time I start a right side row. So it's quite simple, but it doesn't look simple. So when wearing a shadow knitted garments, they'll all come up to you and ask, oh, what is going on? It's just like walking the dog, actually. So if you see it from this angle, you don't see much. It's just a striped piece of fabric. But when you turn it and see it from this angle, can you see? Then you can see the pattern coming. Uh, Interweave asked me to do the book, and uh, it's, it was quite interesting. Um, and also interesting what colors did to shadow knitting. If you show this, yeah. this one, um, it's an example of what colors does. If you look at, for instance, the purple. Oh, sorry. Look to the purple. It's not easy to see that it's the same color. And again, the, look at the yellow. It doesn't look like yellow. So you got to be really, really uh, keen on what you're doing with colors here. And another thing is that you always, I always use a dark color and a light color mm -hmm. because it's in the contrast you see the patterns. It's an elegant kind of fabric for my taste. Yeah. yeah. What other things can you do with shadow knitting? You can do pictures, can't you? Uh, yeah, I didn't do a lot of things. I only did this. Um, but when I Google it, I find very, very interesting interesting examples. There are Bernd, uh, Bernd Kessler, a German who lived in Japan, who has done beautiful things with yeah. shadow knitting. There are others. But I just... Um, it's just a world 
of shared anything out there. Yeah. Yeah. But it wasn't your favorite technique. No. <laughs> I, I need to mention it's also called illusion knitting. Yes. Well, I still yeah. like to do the, the modular. That's my favorite. Yeah. But it's beautiful. You got to knit it for, um, uh, for the look of it because it's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, your 13th book is due to be released in March next year, yeah. 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this book is also on domino knitting, but you've called it modular knitting yeah. this time. So what's the aim of this book? And of course, we'd love to see some of the, some of the designs you've yeah. included. I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one day my granddaughter visited me, as she often do, and uh, I, had, I was wearing this one and she said, well, grandmother, but they are colors that we don't use anymore. And I thought, oh, am I old fashioned? And I said, what? but what color do you like? And then she picked these colors and this soft and nice yarn. And I made this one for her. And it's basically made, so it's like, I call them stairs. And one stair is knitted in garter stitch. And the next stair is purled. And if you purl all the rows, it'll look exactly like garter stitch. And then I knit one and purl one. And it, the reason why I do it is that I want them to be joined as I go. I don't want any sewing. And at the end, I got this little tip and it was such a nice little design element. Yeah, it's beautiful, mm -hmm. right in the center of the neckline. Yeah. So when I did that, um, what happened was we got the corona. And I thought, what am I going to do? I, I can't, I'm stuck at home and uh, Denmark closed down. So I thought, well, I'll do a book again. <laughs> As, uh, I didn't think I should do any more books, but well, now it's a book. So it will be published in March. And this is, uh, as you saw from the domino knitting, maybe you saw that, I knit one panel and then I knit a sort of cross panel and another panel and a cross panel. Just a way of knitting pan panels together. So this one's up and this one's in, in that this direction. direction. Yeah. I wanted it to be, I want eight schools so that if you want to teach, you can use my schools for teaching. Okay. And this one is, uh, so you sort of knit this and purl and knit and purl and because it looks like garter stitch and you always but do, you just that do so it that you alternately can, and you do that alternately so you can join it together yeah. well yeah okay and the same thing happens here you purl the first and then you knit this this uh, angle and then you purl and then you knit and this is um, interesting design element you can use it for a lot of funny things and this is, um, these are squares, but I knit a triangle, like you knit the green triangle in short rows and end up here with only one stitch or two. And then you join, go this way and join. In that case, you can, it looks like a domino square, but it's not. And you can have one half in one color and the other half in the other color. Okay, so short rows with domino knitting. <laughs> yeah. And then this is um, this is not exactly the same as uh, Sophie's as this one, because it's in the other direction. But again, I purl here, I knit, and I purl. And I I the first reason why I did it was that I wanted these little dots to be in different directions, so you can do fun things like you see here. They are in different directions. Yeah. Yeah. And the same stairs, if you knit them um, horizontally, they look like they look like zigzags, and that's what Sophie's um, little top is based on. And then I thought um, I hadn't explained this uh, the clam technique, uh, horseshoe clam technique, but this particular uh, pattern. 
I saw it from a blanket from 1850. Um, and I thought, well, let's do that. And it's on the table. It's a huge, huge um, shawl. It's a wing shawl. Oops, sorry. And it's like, yeah, it's a very nice shawl to wear when you're cold. And you can even use it as a sort of blanket. Let's put this out well, of the, the way. Last, I, I just need to tell you about the last little yeah. school, which is short rows knitted in circles. And there, are, of course, there are designs with that. This is um, a, an asymmetrical um, top, or what I don't know what you call it, where you, you begin here, you cast on a number of stitches, and then you knit a long panel. And when you are here, you start knitting them together, joining them, and then you knit, you go in a spiral, is that a word? Yeah. And I end up with a very nice edging and very nice bind off. And um, yeah, so that's it's it. lovely. And so again, it's, like it's, big... it's not my kind of colorway, <laughs> but I had that's a lot beautiful. of fun by, yeah. by combining colors in a different way yeah. than I was used to. Yeah, it's great. Mm -hmm. So she has helped you on the book, which must a feel lot. Yeah. very special and unique. Yes. So absolutely. what has it been like to work with her creatively? It's been wonderful, and I mean, she is um, she's very interested in uh, in designing and in decorating, and uh, we have a lot of discussion about that and art. And I hope she'll be an architect or yeah. something like that. Yeah. So she's picked all the colorways. Yeah. For you, and yeah. are they growing on you? I like them. Yes, yeah. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> I think they're of very course. beautiful too. Yeah. So that'll be an exciting book to come out. Yeah. And um, you've done the. She also was a style director for the for the book and and helping with the photo shoot for the styling. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but she doesn't knit. She doesn't That's knit. Too bad. You'll have to start her on. <laughs> yeah. Or she might now if she sees things like this. Maybe <laughs> she might get really excited yeah. about designing her mm -hmm. own things. Well, look, it's been really lovely to spend time with you and just hear all of the developments that you've done with domino knitting and, and modular knitting. Yeah. It's, it's really exciting and the viewers will be very appreciative as well. So thank you for spending time with us. Thank you very much. It's been lovely. Good. <laughs> Let's say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye. Bye.